Hello and good evening, everyone. We're so glad you can join us tonight. While we're waiting and we're getting set up, I'm just going to introduce myself. My name is William Roca. I'm the Director of Programs here at Village Preservation. So glad you're going to be able to join us this evening for our presentation by Lottie Whalen of Radicals and Rogues, the Women That Made New York Modern. Before we get started, if you're not familiar with Village Preservation, we were founded back in 1980, and we are dedicated to bringing to life the cultural history of Greenwich Village, East Village, and NoHo, and protecting the historic buildings of our neighborhoods. We've helped get over 1,250 buildings landmarked and had zoning protections for over 100 blocks in our neighborhood. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Village Preservation and all the work that we do, head on over to villagepreservation.org, or better yet, go ahead and scan that QR code and donate and help support the work we do. If you do support by donation, or even better yet, becoming a member, because Village Preservation is a member-based organization, you'll help support not only the advocacy work that we do, but also the 75 to 80 free programs a year that we offer to the public covering all different aspects of the history and culture of our neighborhood. Now, before we hand it over to tonight's speaker, if you're interested in some more of the program, we have one more January program that we are doing with our partners at the Merchant's House Museum, Edgar Allan Poe, The Man, The Mystery, and The Legend. That will be next Wednesday, the 17th of January at 6 p.m. But now I'm going to go ahead and introduce this evening's speaker, Lottie Whalen. She's a writer, researcher, and curator working in the fields of feminist history, avant-garde art, and textiles. She's the co-founder of Decorating Dissidents, an interdisciplinary arts project that considers radical histories of craft and its potential as a force for change in the modern day. She's joining us live all the way from Glasgow in the UK. So thank you, Lottie, very much for joining us because we know it's quite late over there. But I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will hand it over to you. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, William. For thanks for this invite. It's um, lovely to be here, even though it's late. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining. Um, I'm just going to set my PowerPoint. Um, is that working? Yep. Yeah. Great. <clears throat> okay, so um, I'm going to start my talk by giving a very brief overview of my book, Radicals and Rogues: The Women Who Made New York Modern. Um, before then focusing on the role of Greenwich Village and the women who lived there. So Radicals and Rogues is an introduction to a group of women whose experiments in life and art set the tone for the rise of New York as the 20th century's capital of modern culture. In 1910s and 20s New York, women were pushing at the limits of all kinds of boundaries, of bodies, of form, of creative disciplines and of the city, of the city itself. They were part of a broader movement that saw women demanding new freedoms and opportunities. Across the divides of class, race and nation, women reimagined the self and fought for the chance to realise their vision. To be equal citizens, to study, to work and do so safely, to have bodily autonomy, to rethink approaches to marriage and the family. Against expectations, they opened businesses, were politically active, and flocked to modern metropolises to build independent lives. Some looked for new ways to be wives and mothers, while also cultivating rich intellectual identities. Some rejected heteronormative expectations for relationships with other women and to build queer communities. Some risked their livelihoods to campaign for better working conditions, civil rights, voting rights, and an end to discrimination on the grounds of race and gender. All of them were united in harnessing a restless energy that surged through women in the febrile at atmosphere of early 20th century New York, and Greenwich Village was one of its hotspots. Beginning with the 1913 Armory show, Radicals and Rogues explores the city's salons and studios and introduces the women that shaped them, including Mabel Dodge, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, Marguerite Zorak, Clara Tice, Mina Loy, Beatrice Wood and Florine Stettheimer. One of the starting points for the book was the story behind 
Marcel Duchamp's infamous fountain and its controversial legacy. Although it's instantly recognizable today, Fountain was rejected from the Society of Independent Artists' first annual exhibition, held in New York in April 1917, despite the Society's declaration that there would be no jury, no prizes, and a totally open democratic submission process. Until Duchamp claimed the work and authorized replicas decades later, the only public record of Fountain's existence was a striking photograph, which you can see on the left, taken by Al Alfred Stieglitz and reproduced on a full page of The Blind Man, a magazine created by Duchamp and his friends, the artist Beatrice Wood and writer and art dealer Henri Pierre Rocher to celebrate their avant-garde scene. In addition to the photograph, the magazine contained tongue-in-cheek defenses of Fountain by Beatrice Wood and writer and Vogue magazine editor Louise Norton, alongside work by other women writers and artists in their circle. It was a sketch by Clara Tice, a futurist poem by Francis Simpson Stevens, and a fragmented prose poem compiled by Mina Loy. Recently, some art critics have claimed that Duchamp stole Fountain from another artist, the one woman legend and one time resident of Greenwich Village, Baroness Elsa von Freitag Lorenhoven, known for her uninhibited sexual performances, witty found object art and scatological wordplay. There are many reasons I disagree with this theory. Um, and art historian Dawn Addis's argument is comprehensive and can be found easily online. So I won't spend time on it here. Um, but for one, I feel that those who seek to champion the Baroness over Duchamp in an act of feminist recovery risk further obscuring the contribution of other key women who were vital members of the New York avant-garde in the 1910s. Much more compelling evidence leads us to Norton and Wood as Duchamp's provocative co-conspirators. What's more, in my view, the de determination to credit Fountain as the work of one genius is a misguided endeavor. Fountain was significant as an event or a statement rather than an object in and of itself. It was, in essence, the expression of the radical spirit of a collective of creatives who gravitated to the New York Salon of art patron Louise and Walter Arensberg and the vibrant Bohemian community in Greenwich Village. Many of them were talented, influential, but now largely forgotten modern women who imbued the New York avant-garde with a defiant feminist streak. By referring to these women as radicals and rogues, I wanted to pay tribute to the unique intertwined mix of serious intent and playful provocative joie de vie that characterized the scene they created. To celebrate their boldness in creating new ways of living and also to nod to the environment of radical politics in which they worked, which was fueled by suffragists and social and anarchist activists, such as Emma Goldman, Margaret Sanger and Clara Lemlich. Even artists and writers who claimed to be apolitical were working in this charged atmosphere and responding in some way to new theories of organizing society, of understanding the modern self and for women especially, of being a full citizen in the modern world. And Rogues is a tribute to the irreverent little magazine Rogue, edited by Louise Norton and her then husband, Alan Norton, which characterized the New York scene's provocative spirit. In particular, Louise Norton's idiosyncratic style of fashion commentary, written under her alter ego, Dame Rogue, breezily theorized the link between women's bodily autonomy, their political enfranchisement, modern fashion, and creative freedom. Rogue magazine was short-lived, but a roguish spirit remained and vitalized work created by this group of women in the decades that followed, from Beatrice, Beatrice Wood's absurd Dada sketches and ceramics to painter Florine Stettheimer's camp style. And before continuing, I want to point out that Radicals and Rogues is the story of some of the women who made New York modern. Its scope is limited to women of the New York avant-garde, all of whom were white and from socially privileged backgrounds, whose impact on what became known as New York Dada has been overlooked or diminished in favor of great male artist narratives centered around Duchamp and Man Ray. There are, of course, many other equally significant groups that nurtured cultural innovation and radical experimentation in the city in the early 20th century. For example, the Harlem Renaissance had an equally vibrant salon culture at its center also dominated by radical restless women 
such as beauty empire heiress and arts patron Elalia Walker, whose extravagant parties were frequented by writers and intellectuals such as Zora Neale Hurston and Langston Hughes, or literary editor of the Crisis magazine, Jesse Redmond Fawcett, who hosted leading Harlem Renaissance writers and artists at her apartment on Sunday afternoons. In many ways, Radicals and Rogues is just one part of a much bigger story of the phenomenon of the modern woman in pre-World War II New York. So, to Greenwich Village. In the 1910s, the village became known as Bohemia, or the Smock Colony, which was in reference to the loose-fitting artistic smocks that village women wore. These nicknames symbolised its separation from the rest of the city and its open attitudes towards alternative lifestyles. I think the Smock Colony best encapsulates the village's core qualities and quirks at this time. Women were absolutely at the forefront of its cultural and political life. Their fashion choices represented a physical liberation from old-fashioned corsetry and other restrictive garments that went hand in hand with many other freedoms that villagers were seeking. In village bookshop owner Frank Shea's opinion, in all this great United States, it is the only place a person can sport a stocking with a hole in the heel and an idea. Elsewhere, both are taboo. Casting conservative values aside, the village's residents embarked on experiments in new ways of living and creating art. Life itself was a creative practice. To this end, interior decoration, clothing and socialising all became part of collaborative efforts to build modern communities and break free from the past. Much of village life played out in its cafes, tea rooms and restaurants, all of which offered cheap meals in informal surroundings. Many, such as Polly's, the Mad Hatter and Romani Marie's, were run by women who were also active members of artistic and political circles. They were spaces of lively camaraderie, where residents would gather each evening to exchange ideas, to drink and to cut loose. Proprietor Romani Marie, you can see here in um, a photograph by Jesse Tarbox Beale describes them as centres, not so much restaurants as centres for people to get off the edge of the ordinary. Restless women were at the heart of village life, whether ag agitating for change on the picket line, making avant-garde art in their studios, or dressed in a daring outfit and causing a stare at a cafe. Women were leading active public lives that defied society standards and broke the boundaries that previously constrained the lives of the older generation. In short, much of the village's radical energy stemmed from a generation of women who demanded new freedoms and were determined to refashion society. And for me, um, in writing this book, understanding the role of uh, Greenwich Village was essential to come in to understand just how significant the artists, artists and writers featured in the book were and continue to be. Um, most of these women often appear as footnotes or minor figures, and they're depicted as eccentrics who are living kind of unconventional lives outside of society. But while it's true that the village came to represent a sort of bohemian utopia in the media at the time, it was a space where very real socio socio-political concerns met and sometimes found expression through the creative arts. Although the feminist and anarchist activism of, fig of figures such as Emma Goldman seem on the surface far removed from the whimsical art of Clara Tice or witty fashion commentary by Louise Norton, the fight for women to be equal citizens extended across art, politics, fashion and relationships. Polly's Cafe, which you can see here in another photograph um, from the era, is perhaps the best example of this meeting between radical politics and art. It was decorated in bright fovis colours with green walls and simple wood tables and chairs. And it really was the quintessential village cafe. Its proprietor, Paula Polly Holiday, was an anarchist and grew up in a creative family. Her mother, Adele, was an actress and a friend of playwright Eugene O'Neill's father, James, who was also an actor, and O'Neill was a close friend of Polly's brother, Louis. Few records of Holiday's life and the lives of their family survive, beyond references in the letters and autobiographies of better-known villagers. In the words of writer W. Adolph Roberts, she was a robust young woman, a frequenter of rebel balls given by all factions. 
and O'Neill's wife, Agnes Bolton, recalls a tall, dark-eyed and calm woman with an interesting and receptive mind who gave her place the air of a club. Polly was also assisted by her lover, Hippolyta Havel, an anarchist activist who gained notoriety after being arrested in connection with the assassination of President William McKinley in 1901, along with his on-off lover, Emma Goldman. Bohemian poet Harry Kemp felt that Polly's Cafe was a creative act in and of itself. He said, in the creation of her unique little restaurant, Holiday had achieved art, had hit upon her right form of expression. And Polly sparked the vital sense of community that sustained Greenwich Village's Bohemia through the 1910s. It was the meeting place for feminist society heterodoxy and shared patrons with the Greenwich Village Liberal Club. Its popularity led to other similar venues opening, each which offered an individual spin on Polly's informal, cheap and cheerful model. Women in particular were keen to follow Holiday's lead by becoming proprietors of village cafes and restaurants. Before long, the majority of businesses in the area were run by women sporting the bobbed hair, patterned smock dresses and sandals that were the village's um, you know, unofficial um, uniform. But the influx of competitors never succeeded in overtaking Polly's as the village's quintessential venue. By the time Alice Anna, Anna Alice Chapin wrote her 1917 village guidebook, Polly's was an institution. In Chapin's words, Polly's was Greenwich Village in Little, a fixed representative and sacred space that was indispensable to village life. Despite growing tourist interest, Polly's remained the key location for a who's who of Bohemia on any given evening. Artist Clara Tice might be found dining and gossiping with Vanity Fair editor Frank Crowninshield, as Crystal and Max Eastman sat discussing plans for the Masses magazine. Or Louise Norton would be holding court while Margaret Stanger and Emma Goldman planned campaigns for birth control at the next their table. And Polly's was also the place where, in 1915, a little known artist called Clara Tice transformed into the Queen of Greenwich Village, a 1910 New York, uh, 1910s New York's It Girl. An exhibition of her nude sketches held at the cafe attracted the attention of Anthony Comstock, the head of the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice, who forced the show to close. Comstock cast a dark shadow over the, over the village and the work of artists and writers in Tice's circle. He embodied everything that the village's liberated new women were fighting against. He was a puritanical patriarch who sought to drag outdated Victorian morality into the 20th century. He waged a lifelong war on vice and worked tirelessly to ban the distribution of so-called obscene materials. Comstock's crusade against birth control and sex education brought him into frequent conflict with Greenwich Village feminists. Both Margaret Stanger and Emma Goldman were prosecuted under the, the Com Comstock Act for campaigning on the issue of contraception and sex education. Comstock was equally, equally fervent in his pursuit of art and literature that he deemed to be promoting licentious behavior. Guido Bruno, publisher and self-proclaimed mayor of Greenwich Village, had a number of run-ins with Comstock for publishing material that defended the rights of sex workers. Um, and Tice's nudes, which you can see on, this, on the right of this slide and a few others on here, um, they may seem quaint and whimsical and very inoffensive by today's standards, um, but by aligning herself and her work with Polly's and its radical network, Tice links the joyful bodily freedoms portrayed in her sketches with the wider fight for bodily autonomy that some feminists were engaged in. Her sketches show women living active public lives in defiance of old-fashioned moralizers like Comstock, who sought to combine them to lives of domesticity. As a public figure and as an artist, Tice came to best represent the women of the smock colony and their determination to bob their hair, wear short skirts and modern underwear, smoke and play sport, vote and work after marriage. Around the same time that Tice became a Greenwich Village icon, the area itself took off in the public imagination. Greenwich Village bohemianism was a byword for exactly the kind of taboo breaking behavior and shockingly modern fashion that made perfect tabloid fodder. As a result, Tice became a key part of the village myth. In Tice's own words, she was good copy. And so 
My bobbed hair, long before I'm in Castle, five foot, hundred pound figure, my working costume of riding breeches and boots became a familiar spot in the papers every time something unusual happened in Greenwich Village and a picture was needed in a hurry. Alongside Tice, writer and artist Juna Barnes was one of the village's quintessential characters whose reputation grew alongside the neighbourhoods. In a series of articles for the New York Morning Telegraph's Sunday magazine, she offered tantalising peeks into the antics of Greenwich Village's bohemian movers and shakers and evocatively conjured up the heady, decadent atmosphere that prevailed there. In a playful, mocking tone, Barnes guided her reader through a day in the life of a villager, which starts in the late afternoon and ends in the small hours of the morning, long after everything else in the city closes up and the lights go out. In her Greenwich Village articles, Barnes poked fun at the village's crowd of artists and writers, caught up in an endless cycle of parties in their bohemian bubble. At the same time, she also teased the general public whose fascination with the village led the media to fuel the myth of bohemia. In an article entitled Becoming Intimate with the Bohemians, Barnes describes meeting a mother and her two daughters prowling the streets, desperately looking for the authentic Greenwich village that they had heard so much about. They chase after a woman in a gingham gown with a portfolio under her arm, traipse through Polly's and the Dutch oven, and demand that a red-haired birth control activist tell them whether she is an artist or not. Barnes names the bejeweled and fair-trimmed woman, Madame Bronx, to signal that she is part of the growing tribe of slummers, a slang, a slang term given to tourists coming from uptown to slum it in the village for an evening and observe the scandalous sights of women smoking and dancing. Bronx, like the slummer Alexis, who appears in a subsequent article, ends up disappointed that the village doesn't quite live up to its hedonistic, shocking reputation. Barnes was an adventurous and creative reporter. She was skilled at uncovering the city's unconventional characters and its vibrant nightlife, and daring enough to take part in risky escapades, such as jumping from a skyscraper or being force-fed. Her articles fizz with life as she traverses all corners of the city, meeting marginalized and unconventional people each with fascinating stories to tell. Unlike many of the journalists reporting on the neighborhood's eccentric artistic community, Barnes was an insider, which placed her in the strange position of wanting to both reveal and protect the village and its lively cast of characters. While living in and reporting on Greenwich Village in 1915, Barnes wrote and illustrated the Book of Repulsive Women, which was published by Guido Bruno, um, and it was a chat book that celebrated transgress transgressive queer urban bodies, which was obviously inspired by high life in the village. Surprisingly, it escaped the censors, perhaps because Dan Barnes's decadent language left them baffled. One figure that Barnes likely had in mind when she wrote the book of repulsive women was the Baroness Elsa von Freitag Lorenhoven one of the most eccentric and truly avant-garde villagers of the 1910s. She was an artist and a poet, and in her biographer, Irene Gamel's words, a neurasthenic, kleptomaniac, man-chasing proto-punk. Perhaps her most striking creation was herself. The Baroness pounded the city streets, dressed in outlandish costumes made of salvaged rubbish and cast-off household items. She was described in one of Juna Barnes's articles as wearing a wig of purple and gold, caught roguishly up with strands from a cable once used to more importations from Far Cathay and sporting red trousers. As you can get a, a glimpse of on the photograph on the right, she transformed Christmas baubles, curtain rings, tea strainers, and even a canary in a cage into jewelry, the perfect accessories to complement her tin can bra and bizarre outfits. The Baroness was a living work of art and New York City was both her stage and her studio. She was exactly the sort of character that slumming tourists to the village hoped to spot, and she was hard to miss. Some members of the city's creative circles were less enthusiastic. Rumour had it that the genteel poet Wallace Stevens dared not even step foot south of 14th Street when in Manhattan for fear of meeting her. When the little magazine, at, when the little review um, an avant-garde magazine, moved to Greenwich Village in 1917. Its editors, Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson, quickly identified the Baroness as an avant-garde trailblazer. Heap declared in a 1919 editorial 
that the Baroness was the only one living anywhere who dresses Dada, loves Dada and lives Dada. Her obscene and erotic work became a regular feature of the in the magazine alongside the work of James Joyce. But the village that provided inspiration and a haven for the likes of the Baroness and Juna Barnes was under threat as the 1920s approached. The story of another of the village's creative women, photographer Jessie Tarbuck's Beald, highlights the rapidly changing nature of the neighbourhood during this time. The work of Jessie Tarbuck's Beals provides a really vital and unique insight into the world and the vibrant feminist character of the Smock Colony. Her photographic portraits of village life show charming scenes of its cafes, studios and colourful residents. In these images, we find everyday scenes with subjects smiling for the camera or caught joking amongst themselves, the kind of photographs that friends and family might take. This informality is striking for the time when women were more often photographed posing in elegant evening attire or standing stiffly alongside their families. By contrast, Beale's subjects are relaxed in stylish yet casual outfits. Location is just as important as style with most of the women photographed in places of work. Beale's subjects were women who cast off traditional roles as wives and mothers, stepped out of the domestic realm and became active in building up Greenwich Village's creative community. In addition to cafes, craft studios and gift shop owners, including um, here, the, the ukulele playing Miss Crump of the Crumpery Cafe and here, um, the androgynous Jimmy Criswell, owner of the Mad Hatter's Tea Room. Beale's photographs reveal the surprisingly diverse jobs that women took on. Um, and this image on the left, you can see Charlotte Powell, the village decorator, who appears with cropped hair and grubby overalls astride a ladder. And in other images, we find Sonia, who sells art cigarettes in elegant flowing patterned robes and leather sandals, and Adele Kennedy, the Greenwich Village tour guide, which chat into well-dressed groups outside of the treasure box. Many of these village bohemians have been lost to the mists of time, leaving little record beyond Beals's portraits or footnotes in the biographies of more successful figures. By assembling these fragments, we can work out that most of the women's studio and shop owners were also artists and designers who set up businesses as a way to make a regular income from their talents. Women such as Heterodoxy member Amy Marley Hicks, who we can see here in her studio, surrounded by the Batik dyed clothing and handcrafted drapes, rugs, and assorted homewares that she made alongside her feminist activism. Craft shops that sold clothes, accessories, and homewares were particularly popular with, in Juna Barnes' words, the endless crowd of slummers looking for painted beads and black tassels. <clears throat> and in one village photograph, which you can see on the right of the slide, Beals turns the camera on herself. She smiles a little awkwardly, as if uncomfortable in front of the lens, and poses outside the village art gallery at 68 Sheridan Square. Beals set up the gallery in 1917 after divorcing her husband. She used the space to host small exhibitions, as a tea room and also as a shop to sell postcards of her village photography, cannily capitalising on the area's thr thriving tourist industry. Her postcards were intended to be commercial items with cultural currency. Slummers on a trip to the village could purchase an image of Polly's or Louise Allison's studio to show off to their friends, signalling that they were in the know. In this way, Beale's postcards were portable pieces of Bohemia designed to infiltrate distant corners of America with eccentric images of the much talked of phenomenon, the modern woman. In this way, Beals occupies a complex position in the history of the village. On the one hand, she created a unique archive of life there and the people that turned it into a bohemian bastion of creativity and freedom. Beals herself also lived the life of a modern liberated woman. She was the first published female photojournalist in the United States a fearless photographer who dragged her huge 50 pound camera wherever it was needed to get the best shot. And after her divorce, she independently supported herself and her daughter with this photography business. 
But on the other hand, Beale's commercial work was part of the commodification of the village. Her photographs create a relatively sanitised view of the village scene. They depict some androgynous villagers, such as Jimmy Criswell, who you see here again at the Mad Hatter's Tea Room. Um, but Beale's cheery captions often accompanied the postcards, gloss over the more subversive aspects of village life. Removed from the broader context of their lives, the women in Beale's photographs are eccentric but unthreatening. With her photojournalist's eye, Beale's recognised the village's public appeal and saw a way to turn its bohemian atmosphere into a popular product. But ironically, Beale's became a victim of the village's changing status when, in 1919, her building was purchased by the Corn Exchange Bank and demolished. Beale's fortunes faltered in the following years, and many of her negatives and prints were lost when she died in poverty at the Bellevue Hospital in 1942. But luckily, some were saved by her fellow photographer and villager, Alexander Alland, leaving us with this really, truly unique insight into 1910's Greenwich Village. The crowd of tourist slummers had certainly impacted on the village's spirit of, of uh, freedom and community. They intruded in the spaces that artists and writers had carved out specifically to get away from bourgeois state society. In an article about Greenwich Village that appeared in a March 1920 issues, issue of the Ladies' Home Journal, Jimmy Criswell bemoaned the fact that lady slummers who read the Ladies' Home Journal are swamping us with quartets of old ladies infesting the front room of the cafe. But Beale's situation highlights that by the turn of the 1920s, the village was under threat from more than just lady slummers. The opening of the 7th Avenue subway extension in the summer of 1919 linked the village to Wall Street by a 10 minute train ride. This development helped to reshape the landscape of the village and cause property prices to skyrocket. Two years later, an article in the New York Tribune, um, you can see here, told a story of gentrification that I'm sure is all too familiar to 21st century residents of New York, London, and other major cities across the world. Asking, where is the artist who is rich enough to rent a studio in Greenwich Village? It notes the rise in rent. In the early 1910s, the best apartment in Washington Square South could be had for $45 a month and a private room for as little as $5. But by 1921, a basic apartment in the village cost well over $75 and a private room without a bath could not be found for less than 60. Predicting that this problem would follow artists around the city and beyond, the writer worries about what will become of America's contribution to modern art if artists lack a community. But he shows less concern for New York's African-American and immigrant communities, which had already been marginalised in the original bohemian takeover of the village, suggesting that artists could invade Manetta Lane, an area of the South Village, with a large black community, the writer draws attention to the level of privilege that white bohemian artists enjoyed, despite financial precarity, and anticipates later cycles of gentrification in the city. But of course, this was far from the end of the village's significance as a place of protest, radicalism, and counterculture. Greenwich Village's radicals and rogues might have failed to spark a full-scale revolution, but the tremors of their actions can be felt over the course of the century that followed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lottie. That was amazing. Fantastic. So folks, as you think of some questions, please go ahead and pop those into the Q&A feature. But to kind of kick us off with the Q&A session, being from the UK, what interested you in exploring this part of New York City history? What what brought you to this part of the world to, to write this amazing book? Yeah, um, so I think it all started really with my PhD thesis, which was on the writer and poet Mina Loy. Um, I was really struck by her experiences, first of all, in the 1910s in New York, when she joined, as we just discussed, this kind of vibrant scene. But then well, she left for a period to go back to Europe and she returned at the onset of the Second World War and her experience was a completely different. Um, so whereas in the 1910s she was celebrated in the newspapers, you know, she was described by one um, New York magazine as the sort of quintessential modern woman. 
but by the 1940s she was completely marginalized you know she was living in poverty and and really not not part of any artistic scene so i was i was kind of interested in what prompted that shift and and you know that why that dramatic change had happened um but also i was drawn into the stories of the other women in her network especially in the 1910s um and as i mentioned that kind of story that was behind um fountain and, and that group of women who were really quite lost in that story um so yeah once i finished my phd uh, i was kind of right i've got to get onto this this bigger story and and of all the the different women that you've explored in the book are there some that were you found a little more interesting were there any favorite folks that that you were exploring and that that you really enjoyed learning more and more about I mean, who who couldn't be kind of obsessed with the Baroness? <laughs> kind of the most uh, intriguing figure, and I just think, wow. I mean, I wouldn't even say she's ahead of her time. I think she's ahead of our time now. <laughs> she's in a whole yeah. different world. Um, yeah, I think learning about uh, more about her her life and her experiences in the village, and obviously, I didn't really have time in this talk to touch on it. But she's quite an interesting figure in the fact that really for these avant-garde circles, she was too much. Like she was often quite um, sort of rejected by a lot of the men in the, these circles because she was intimidated, but she intimidated them. And she was kind of, she was a bit older than the, the other women and she was very physical and um, quite dominant. So, so that was really off-putting. And, and I think that's, her story is quite interesting and it shows the limits of the avant-garde at this time and the limits for women particularly. And, and, you know, the Baroness being from Germany originally, and and I do know that she eventually returned to Berlin, but were there any other kind of international influences and links from these women from their own travels, from where they originated from, and, you know, brought in different influences of avant-garde from around the world? Yes, yeah, that was definitely a really important um, aspect, especially... Um, so on Rogue magazine, which I touched on in the beginning of the talk, um, you find that although there's this moment, it was a very exciting moment of American modernism and, you know, bringing new and something fresh and, and young, they also wanted to incorporate elements of the sort of European avant-garde traditions. And this is why someone like Mina Loy, who was what, British by birth, but then she was moving across all the different um, circles of the, the avant-garde in Europe before she went to New York, she was sort of really seized upon by these magazines as, as like giving them some kind of cultural currency. Um, similarly with Gertrude Stein as well, her work is included um, in these magazines to really give it this force and say like, look, this is legitimizing what we're doing um, in New York by getting the kind of backup and the interest of people coming from uh, Europe. And you know, these women were, as as you say, radicals and rogues for the time. What do you feel are some of the most important lasting legacies that, that still reverberate even today from, from their work, from their personalities? You know, I think we're still kind of coming, you know, they're still unfolding and we're still finding new ways um, of understanding their work and how it's relevant today. I mean, I feel like the Baroness has some really obvious kind of resonances in the mid-century and the um, second wave feminism and performers like Carly Schneeman, um, who is kind of really bodily um, feminist performance art. I think she's definitely a kind of foremother of, of those. Um, but even, I think, and I, I haven't had a chance to touch on her um, because she wasn't really part of the Greenwich Village scene as such, but Florine Stettheimer, who was working in this quite extravagant kind of camp style um, that for years was dismissed as being sort of, you know, quite quaint and feminine. Um, I think that's gaining a different resonance um, today as we're kind of questioning gender and, and how we portray the self um, through art. So I think it's, yeah, there's a lot still to do and a lot still to think about, I think. And and as you mentioned, a lot of them were coming from outside of the city and, and changing the, the makeup of the neighborhood. But were any of them themselves native to not only New York, but specifically Greenwich Village and the surrounding neighborhoods? I'm not, I don't think um, native to Greenwich Village, but 
Clara Tice was a New Yorker by birth and uh, she never actually she never left the US um, and I think for me she's got this real understanding of city life I think which maybe comes from our experiences just as living growing up there um, the kind of new rhythms um, you know the fast pace and kind of getting out and about and, and the new kind of interest in dances and public um, you know public dance halls and all this kind of thing that really come through in her work I think I think that comes from her being attuned to city life in a, a really fast-paced modern metropolis like New York was at the point. And we have one question here. Do you know the the exact location and it's of Polly's restaurant and the Mad Hatter Cafe? Do you know where they were originally located? <laughs> it's in my book. <laughs> Not in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a little plug to buy the book. <laughs> but, oh, absolutely. Um... <laughs> we put it already in the chat so folks see the link in the chat. Yeah, as you mentioned, it's a bit late here, so <laughs> it might not all be here. <laughs> and um, as you were doing research on all these incredible women, where where were some of the places that you actually, what archives did you visit? What were some of the resources that you learned to, to you know, learn more about these these women's lives? Yeah, so as it's, it's part of my PhD, I was really lucky to get some research trips um, over to, not just to New York, and um, to the Beinecke as well. Um, at Yale um, and places like the New York Public Library um, were really helpful. That's that's that was great to to do while I was doing, let's say, doing the PhD. Um, and then I was lucky enough because some of the writing process was through the pandemic. Um, so obviously that scuppered some of the, the sort of research trips. But um, I made some contact with some really kind of really great collectors and and archivists. Um, and some, so even some personal, some family members. So Marguerite Zorak, who's again another, I didn't another one I didn't get a chance to talk about, but she was um, had an apartment in Greenwich Village that functioned kind of as a salon and as a studio. Um, and her relatives who are still alive, I was in touch with. So it was quite a long, a long process, and so partly in person, and then partly had to move online. And was there, in, in your research, was there a particular document or journal or something that you you came upon that was really extraordinarily fascinating for you? I think um, Rogue magazine, which was only quite short-lived between like 1914 and 1915, but um, it's such a fascinating uh, example of what was going on at the time, particularly for this kind of... Um, women woman led movement um i'd come across it a little bit from because it's got some poetry by mina loy and gertrude stein but i think one of the things that's really under researched is the contribution of louise norton who i've mentioned as being one of the other kind of queens of, of the village at this time um and just her fashion uh, columns are just fascinating really ahead of its time you know because obviously now we're a bit more we're used to that kind of commentary and critical fashion can be it can be critical and and it can cross over into theory but she was such a forerunner of it and really intellectualizing fashion but in quite a fun way as well so um i think reading her columns really helped me understand that scene that greenwich village scene and how what women were wearing and how they were presenting themselves crossed over so much into the politics of the time I have one question here in 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 your research, did you uh, research any of the men in these women's lives, their fathers, husbands, lovers, et cetera, and and how they may have influenced them and vice versa? Um, yeah, of course. Um, I mean, Duchamp is kind of comes through the book com constantly, um, you know, and he's, I think in every every woman, um that I've written about that as the focus of a chapter has a relationship with him um and I think that's that's um really a really fascinating example like I guess touching on what we've spoken about before bringing through that European tradition of avant-garde art and how he, he introduced that and he was in dialogue and it was went both ways you know I think he his art and his theory of art gained a lot from the women that he was meeting in New York particularly um Florine Stettheimer and her sister Carrie, 
um, and also Beatrice Wood, who we had um, a long standing relationship with. And I think, you know, it's, it's, it's not like a kind of man hating sort of book, book in that way, because actually Duchamp had a really big impact on um, the, the legacy of these women. So for Mina Loy, for Beatrice Wood, and for Florine Stettheimer, in their later years, he helped to put together exhibitions of their work when when they weren't really, you know, people weren't paying as much attention. So he had quite a quite an important role. Um, but on the other hand, you know, it was an, of course it was a mixed bag. And as I mentioned with the Baroness, some of these men, although they were kind of talking the talk of being, you know, sexually liberated and for kind of women's rights, there was a limit. And you know, a woman like the Baroness, who could be too much. You know, she was too forthright. She was kind of too aggressive in her sexuality. And you often you also find that with um a lot of queer women at this time as well in the village scene, that it was kind of you know, there's a sense from some men, like Floyd Dell, who was one of the editors of the masses, um, he tried to cure Edna Vincent Mellet of her lesbianism because he was like you know that you can have your fun but then you've got to come back to sort of um relationships with men because it was actually threatening to some of these men to think that women could be completely independent so yeah it's, it's kind of a very very complex I think when you in that way I think this will be our final question for this evening and is are you working on another book about New York City or or any of these these women and and related topics? Yes, yeah, tentatively. Um, well, two two projects actually that I'm trying to balance at the minute. Um, so I'm still continuing um, to work on cities. Um, the book that I'm planning is it's not just focused on New York. It's kind of a lot of cities of modernism um, and the twenty like big the major cities of the twentieth century. Um, and it's looking at sort of post-war to so the contemporary um, and thinking about feminist art collectives in particular and how their work has shaped the city and called into question you know, who, who cities are for, who they're designed for, um, and setting that work against sort of official narratives of city planning. Um, so one of the things I touch on, come, I mean, yeah, I can't get away from the village, sort of the kind of Robert Moses uh, versus, um, uh, you know, the, the kind of trying to reshape the city and, and you know, the kind of Jane Jacobs activism and, and that kind of thing as a starting point. So, yeah. Um, but then coming back to the women of radicals and rogues, um, I'm also trying to develop a biography of Marguerite Zorak, who I just mentioned earlier one of the women that was important in Greenwich Village scene um, because she had such a fascinating life and career um, and she's not really got as much attention as she should. So, so that's, yeah, awesome. So yeah, all roads lead to Greenwich Village. Yeah, <laughs> so right. we'll definitely have you back <laughs> to work on this project. Yeah. But Lottie, thank you so much for, for your wonderful book and your wonderful presentation. Everyone, please go out, buy the book. We dropped the link there in the chat. Lottie, will let you go so you can go to sleep because it's so very <laughs> late you. over there in the UK. But thank you so much for, for taking the time and, and joining us here. And thank you, everyone else. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, everyone.